chapter 12. We're going to start out now in this uh, new chapter in Luke's Gospel by looking at the first 12 verses. And if you've been with us in our study of Luke, you know that we've just uh, come off a passage at the end of Luke 11 where Jesus was uh, eating with a group of Pharisees and scribes. And, and in that meal, uh, he has warned them about their empty religion. An empty religion known by its external conformity. He gives the illustration there at that meal of the Pharisees being like uh, bowls that are very clean, uh, quite meticulous on the outside, but on the inside are rotten and full of uh, disgusting things. And he says you can clean the outside all you want, but the, the heart is the issue. He, he, he talks about how their empty religion has been fed off of recognition and reputation, how they love uh, people in the marketplace coming and, and praising them for their uh, external conformity and for their uh, religious adherence. And yet, he says they have no true religion because their hearts had not been changed. Therefore, he warns them, they have loaded people down and given them no hope by adding so much to the Word of God, by meticulously going through the commands of God and saying, well, if you, you really want to be righteous, then you'll do this and this and this and this. And yet, at the same time, developing loopholes for themselves so they need not be under those same burdens. And as a result, Jesus says they are deceived. He points out how they have built monuments for the martyred prophets that their ancestors had killed. And and in a sense, it said that, well, we never would have done that. And yet now the living Christ is before them, the word of God in flesh, and they are refusing him because they are deceived. And friends, we are deceived as well. <laughs> so often we too are tempted to have an empty religion. We are tempted to be like the Pharisees who Jesus will continue in this passage to point out were, were hypocrites. They, they put on a religious mask, but their hearts had not been changed. And so my prayer for us today is that we would take the mask off, that we might understand what true religion is, what it means to truly trust in Christ and to experience what Jesus offers us, a life that is unafraid and unashamed. And that is what he now will address to his disciples in this 12th chapter. And so with that introduction, out of reverence for God's word, if you're able, I want to invite you to stand this Lord's Day as I read for us Luke chapter 12, beginning with verse 1. This is what the Word of God says. In the meantime, when so many thousands of the people had gathered together that they were trampling one another, he began to say to his disciples first, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body, and after that have nothing more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, you are of more value than many sparrows. And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will also acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. If you would pray with me. Father, we pray that the very Holy Spirit 
that Jesus speaks of here would enlighten our hearts today to help us to see our hypocrisy, our sin, who would empower us to repent of our sin, who would lead us to faith and repentance. Father, help us to discern the words of our Lord Jesus that we've read this morning and help us to live in obedience to Christ's words. Encourage us in ways we need to be encouraged. Rebuke us in ways we need to be rebuked. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As we begin the 12th chapter of Luke, we begin with a teaching about fear. And so it is fitting to ask the question of ourselves today, what are you afraid of? What do you fear? You may have, for example, a fear of heights known as acrophobia. If that is the case, you share one of the most common fears, but do you know that your chances of falling from any significant height are 1 in 65,000? Now, there are about 50,000 people in Nelson County, so if you know someone who has fallen from a significant height, you are safe. You might have the fear of flying on a plane, which some people have. This is known as areophobia. It is not as common as the fear of heights, and yet many people will refuse to fly out of the fear that something's going to happen. But did you realize your chances of being in a plane accident are 1 in 13 million? And out of that 1 in 13 million that are in an accident, 98% of those accidents do not result in, in fatalities. You may have the fear of snakes, known as being normal. Your chance of getting bit by a snake is 100% if you do anything other than cut its head off. I read that in Science and Common Sense. We all have fears. We're all afraid of something, and there are healthy fears to have, like snakes. There are healthy fears even to have, like a fear of heights at times. It may make you much more cautious and keep you from getting injured. A fear of being in a car accident may make you a more cautious driver. A fear of getting burned protects you in situations where otherwise, if you weren't careful, you might get burned. There are healthy and good fears to have. And then there are unhealthy fears. There are things we need not fear or be concerned about because they lend more towards anxiety and worry, and in the case of our faith, even unbelief. And what we find Jesus dealing with in this passage is that which we should fear and that which we should not fear. Yet there is a healthy fear and reverence for God. That, that is a healthy fear. And there is a very real fear people should have of God's wrath and of hell for those who have not trusted in Christ. But then for those who have trusted in Christ, there are areas here that Jesus addresses where he says, we need not be ashamed, we need not be scared. And so I hope that that will encourage those in Christ today as we look at what Jesus offers us as he has now spoken directly to what the Pharisees could not offer. And what the scribes could not offer, they, they would load people up with burdens and offer them no hope. And now here's Jesus saying to his disciples, I am here to offer you hope. And he says this in the context, Luke tells us, of thousands of people pressing in to the point that they are trampling one another. This is not so different than you might see on the evening news in the coming days of people at a Black Friday event trying to get into a store and rushing through the aisles and crowding together. And when you get that concentrated a number of people in a small space, they are knocking one another over. That's the context here. As Jesus has left this meal with these Pharisees and scribes as they are plotting against him, and even some, it seems, following behind him, continuing to hurl accusations at him that the crowds have gathered, and many are trying to press in. And it's in this context, then, that Luke tells us Jesus turned specifically to his disciples. Certainly, this would have been the twelve and likely other disciples in order to teach them what the Pharisees could not and what the Pharisees knew not. And we're going to walk through those things now with the first observation there before you in your outline. Jesus helps them to see that he 
frees us from the shame of sin. He frees us from the shame of sin. Again, the, the, the description is given. Luke tells us what the context is. And then Jesus says to the disciples in the end of verse 1, Beware, be, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Leaven was a substance uh, primarily containing yeast that was mixed together with flour and with water in order to make the bread, the dough, rise. And what we often see in God's Word is that leaven is used as an illustration and a description of sin. Because in much the same way that you can put just a, a little bit of yeast in a bowl with other ingredients... And watch how that yeast then infiltrates all of those ingredients and, and affects all of them and then causes them to expand and to rise that the scripture says that this is what sin is. That there's no safe sin, there's no minor sins, there's no insignificant sins. Because it just takes a little of that darkness to infiltrate all of the light. And he is now warning against the leaven of the Pharisees, the sin of the Pharisees. Because that's how Jesus so often and others in the scripture speak of sin, that this description of leaven, this is why, for example, we see in so many uh, ceremonies throughout the Old Testament, this call for unleavened bread. That's why when they gathered for the Passover, they had unleavened bread. It was an illustration of purity and holiness. And Jesus has already pointed out that the Pharisees were not pure, they were not holy. Again, that description of the bowl, it's clean on the outside, it's rotten on the inside. The description of the Pharisees is whitewashed tombs. They, they can clean up the tomb, they can clean up the grave marker all they want, but beneath is a rotten corpse. Jesus says, this is the leaven of the Pharisees. This is hypocrisy. This is their sin. This is their struggle. It didn't mean they didn't sin in other ways, but he's saying this, this is the, the primary sin we see when dealing with the Pharisees hypocrisy. In the ancient world, a, a hypocrite was an actor, that they were someone who put on a mask, and they played a part. And while they were wearing that mask, they were pretending to be someone else. They were taking on the character, the, the attributes, the, the language, the thoughts of another. And then later, when they were done with that stage play, they would take that mask off. They would go back to being their normal everyday self. And then when another opportunity would come, they'd put on another mask. They would play another part. You can see then how this relates to the Pharisees. Now, Jesus is saying again that this outer covering, this mask they wear, it, it's one of religious adherence. It's one of piety. It's one of devotion, but, but it's a mask. That there's something else behind the mask. He's saying that they are religious hypocrites. This is the same thing that the way that people describe so many today. In fact, maybe you have invited people to church or spoken to them about your faith, and they have said to you, "Why well, I'm not going to come to church because churches are just full of hypocrites. That they are saying, and at times rightly, that people come into church on Sundays and they, they put on a mask. They behave a certain way. They, they act a certain way. They, they, they praise God. They sing these hymns and songs and they speak to one another in kind ways and they, they talk one way, but then when they leave the church, they take the mask off. They live an entire different way. And again, there, there's a validity to this because there are at times when we see people with that mask off, exposed for who they really are. And we realize they were just playing a part on Sundays. But then there's another aspect of this where we realize as genuine believers that, that we all on some level are hypocrites and will be to the day of glory. <laughs> because we know what we ought to do, and yet so often we don't do what we ought to do. We all will say, I am committed to the things of God, and then we will find ourselves struggling with sin. So on some level, we are all hypocrites, so that when the person says, well, I'm not going to come to the church, it's just full of hypocrites, we can rightly say, there is always room for one more. <laughs> we all struggle with hypocrisy on some level. 
But what Jesus is speaking of here when he says the the leaven of the Pharisees is not a group of people who are truly devoted to God, truly seeking to have true religion, walk in the ways of the Lord. They just fall short every once in a while. He's saying, no, these are people who are self-deceived. They don't know their own hearts. They have been led astray. They are leading others astray. They put on a mask, but beneath it is an entirely different person. It says, beware of this. But beware of the heart of the Pharisee who, as we talked about last Lord's Day, they, they would add to the word of God and they would come up with these many, many stipulations and say, okay, if you're truly going to keep the Sabbath, you may recall from the Mishnah, we read this last week, you, you can't carry anything, you can't have a burden, unless you're able to you know, balance it on the back of your hand or they come up with all these little stipulations. Well, you, you can do it this way. And then within those, they would develop loopholes so that they wouldn't be burdened by the law, while at the same time burdening others with the law. And all the while, Jesus said, they never dealt with their sin. He says of them, verse 2, nothing is covered up that will not be revealed. In other words, one, one day the mask will be taken off, or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard, in the light, and what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. Jesus says, I believe particularly here, of the Pharisee whose, whose leaven was hypocrisy, who wore the mask. He's saying, one day be aware that the mask will come off and all will be revealed. And those, those things you said behind the back of another that you thought they did not hear, everyone will hear that those thoughts you had in the darkness of your heart all will be revealed, that there will be no private sin, private life. Everything will be known. Everything will be revealed. And the good news of the gospel is if your hope is in Christ and your trust is in Christ, Jesus has already dealt with all of that. He's dealt with the darkness of your heart. He, he's dealt with the, the, the minute little things in the corner that you may not even be fully aware of yourself. And as God brings conviction to you about those things and you repent of those things, you understand the truth of the gospel. Jesus already covered that with his blood. But for those not in Christ, there is much to fear here and there is much to be ashamed of. Friend, you, you can fool every person in this room. You cannot fool God. Now, you can wear a mask for centuries, but one day it will come off. And so for those in Christ, there's a great word here, an encouraging word. We need not be ashamed. The enemy wants us to live in shame. Jesus says we've been freed from this shame. There's no shame in the gospel because Jesus has died for our sin. He demonstrates his love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. But for those whose hope is not in the Lord, there is great shame. And so on one hand, there is shame for those who have not trusted in Christ, but for those who have, praise be to God, he, he has freed us from this shame through our Lord Jesus. And he is saying this again to who? To, to his disciples, to those who have trusted in him, those who have faith in him, in the context of who? Of the Pharisees who are still wearing the mask. And so it says you, you need not live in shame. They, they should be living in shame. He also points out, number two here, that, that he rescues us then from the fear of, of the enemy. So there's no need to live in shame and there's no need to live in these unhealthy fears. The first one of which he addresses is the fear of the enemy. Verse 4, he says, but I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more they can do. Now again, Jesus says this in the context of people who are threatening to kill him. Well, we've already come to the point in the gospel accounts where now that the Pharisees and the scribes and many other religious leaders, they are already plotting against Jesus. They are planning on and looking for a way to destroy Jesus. Jesus, in going to this meal with the Pharisees and the scribes, knew, knowingly was going to a meal with those who were plotting against him to kill him. And just think about the severity of that. He, he's not going to sit down for a meal with business competitors. People want to put him out of business. He's not sitting down 
for a meal with people who he knew didn't like him very much or talk behind his back or, or who were plotting with the leaders of the synagogue to not let him preach anymore. These were people who wanted him dead, who wanted angry mobs to come after him. And their desire for his demise will eventually lead to a bloody cross. But this would not just be the course of his life. This would be the course of so many who would follow him. And that's what Jesus is speaking of here. He's saying, you do not need to fear that which you haven't even faced yet. But it is coming. I mean, just from among the twelve, ten of them would be martyrs. Judas would take his own life. John would die in old age having suffered great persecution for his faith in Jesus. And he is speaking in that context and saying, friends, you don't need to be afraid. People are going to come after you. They're going to issue threats against you. He does not say, but I'll make sure nothing happens to you. <laughs> He's saying they will do the worst that they can do, and the worst that they can do is take your life. But after that, they can do nothing. This is an encouraging word more for people in other parts of the world today because we, we don't face this threat. We, we are blessed with freedoms. We, we celebrated that over this the week before last as we celebrate Veterans Day. We, we celebrate that when we celebrate things like our independence. We, we thank God for the freedoms he's given us in this place and this time. They are not promised for another day, but in this place and this time, we have them. And I have no fear that when I leave this church today, that someone's going to attack me and kill me in the parking lot. And yet that is the very reality that brothers and sisters in Christ face around the world today. More now than ever, more believers in Christ will be killed for their faith in Christ this year than were in any previous year, and next year it will be more than it was this year. Those who are martyrs today, who are giving their life for the sake of the gospel, and yet Jesus says, in that context, do not fear those who kill the body. And the question is, why? I mean, think about it. If, if you were under a very real threat that someone was going to come into your home and take your life, would you not be afraid? Now, Jesus, again, speaking in the, the, the context here of martyrdom, he, he says, we need not be afraid. Why? Because the worst they can do is kill you. And if you trust in Christ and believe in Christ, then you are trusting in the glory that is coming. And you rightly understand that at the moment of your death, you will cross into glory. And Jesus says, they can't take that from you. They can't touch that. God's word reminds us that to be absent from the body, to be away from the body, is to be present with the Lord and to be in glory. And so the moment will come in every one of our lives when we will take our last breath, whether it is at the hand of a persecutor or it's of natural causes or, you know, we're the one who fell off the great height. Whatever it is, we will take our last breath, but our very next breath will be in glory. I mean, think about what a marvelous thing that is for the believer. I read a story, an account years ago from D.A. Carson, Don Carson, and he was speaking of his mother. His mother had suffered for, uh, from Alzheimer's for years. In fact, it had gotten to the point where she no longer knew him as her son. And then it got to the point where she didn't even know her own name. And he was set by her bedside, and he would pray with her and talk with her. And as he would mention her name, she, she didn't even know who he was speaking of. But he talked about in the moment of her death. And the moment when she took her last breath, and the moment when just before that moment he said her name and she didn't even know her own name, that in that moment when she breathed her last breath on earth, the very next thing she heard was the Lord Jesus saying her name, and she knew her name. And she was in glory. And friends, that is, a, that is an amazing truth to consider. And Jesus is reminding his disciples of this, there's no guilt in life. You need not be ashamed. There's no fear in death. Why? Because those who kill you can only kill you. <laughs> and after that comes glory. They, they are 
stamping your ticket to eternity with Christ. And so it says, you need not fear them. But then he says this, verse 5, but I warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Now again, the context is this. Jesus turns to the disciples. He's speaking to the disciples. He's speaking to the very ones who have trusted in Jesus. And yet he's speaking in the context of there are literally thousands of people pressing in and hearing as well. There are Pharisees following just behind him and hearing as well. And what is he saying to all of them? Don't fear those who kill the body. Fear the one who, after you're dead, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. And so for the follower of Jesus, there is glory to come. But for the unbeliever, from the one wearing the mask, from the one who might be the most religious of all, if their heart's not been enlightened by the gospel of Jesus and they refuse to trust in Jesus, then there is great fear to be had. And Jesus is clear. There's, there's only one who cast into hell, and it's not Satan. It's God. But we, we tend to give Satan so much more authority and power than the Scripture gives him. We, we view him as if he is somehow the warden of hell, the overseer of hell, that he is the one punishing hell. Friends, that is not what the Scripture says. He is the chief inmate in hell. He is the one rightly under the wrath of God in hell. And all those who follow him, and all those who refuse to repent, and all those who refuse the gospel, and all those who put their trust in a mask of religion rather than in the living Christ, they too will be under the authority of the one with all power over hell. And that is not Satan, that is God. And that is who he says we should fear right. You look around our world today, you see this fear is all but absent from so many who feel like somehow there's this third category floating around out there that, yes, there's those who, who trust in Christ and they're Christians and they'll have their heaven with God and there's those really mean, awful people and they'll, they'll be in hell with Satan. But then, you know, there's this ambiguity and there's the rest of us and that is not an option that God offers. There is no middle ground here. We are either for Christ or we are against him. We are either in Christ or we are not in Christ. We either will be in glory with God in heaven or we will rightfully be in hell. And make no mistake about it, we are all deserving of hell. But God in his grace for us has shined the light of the gospel before us that we might repent and trust in him. You see, we, we see here, Jesus is giving us here this great picture of the sovereignty, not of the enemy, who will be punished in hell along with so many others, the sovereignty of God, and in God's sovereignty, the care of God, and how immensely he cares for us. I mean, notice the picture he gives here. Verse 6, are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Hey, he uses what was about the most worthless thing one could buy in the marketplace. <laughs> a sparrow was not much. In fact, he says here, five of them were sold for two pennies. So you do the math there. Divide two by five, and what do you get? Not much. And these pennies aren't your pennies today, but they were still rather insignificant in Jesus' day. They were worth very little. He says a sparrow is not even worth a whole one of that, which is worth very little. So why is he talking about sparrows? Well, sparrows were something, he says. And while you might not think of it as much, not one of them is forgotten before God. And so that which you deem as having little to no value, even that has value in the eyes of the Creator. Why, then he says, even the hairs on your head are all numbered. Fear not, you are of more value than many sparrows. <laughs> This probably means more to some of us than others when we talk about numbering hairs on head. But, but notice what Jesus is doing here. He's explaining value. Because I don't have much hair, I look this one up. The average middle-aged man, 
has about 100,000 hairs on his head and another 30,000 in his beard. He loses 75 of them a day, just the hairs from his head. And Jesus, this side note here in the language he uses, he doesn't just say that God counts them. That the word he uses is that he values them, meaning that he not only numbers them, he, he knows every one of them. That, that when every one of that which is seemingly impossible for us to count, just, just the minuteness in our lives of just one little hair falling from our head. God knows that hair. And, and I don't think the point here is that God is overly concerned with how much hair we have. Let's just get that straight right now. But, but you see the comparison he's making. That which we laugh about, which we can see as seemingly insignificant, God knows it because God knows us. And if God knows this great detail about the numbers of hairs on our head at any given moment, how much more does he know about the condition of our heart? How much does he, more does he know about what we will face tomorrow? How much more does he care about that which concerns us? And so the, the, the picture here that Jesus has given is, is, is you, don't, you don't need to fear the enemy. <laughs> that the enemy will be under the wrath of God. That the enemy doesn't know all these things of us. God does. God cares. God is sovereign over. Therefore, do not fear the enemy. Put your hope in God. And if your hope's not in God, then, then you absolutely should fear him. Because a reckoning is coming. And the mask will be removed. And what is in the darkness will be brought into the light. Trust in him while you can trust in him. And then third, Jesus says here, he reminds them that he delivers us from not only the fear of the enemy, but the fear of man. Number three, Jesus delivers us from the fear of man. Verse eight, Jesus says, and I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of God also will acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. Again, Jesus offers us not three or four or five categories. There are two. And what are they? That they are those who have trusted in Jesus. They have acknowledged Jesus before man, meaning that they have confessed Christ as their Lord. This is the gospel. The gospel tells us we all have sin and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23, and we rightfully have now then the wage of sin, which is death, Romans 6.23, but God demonstrates his love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Jesus died for us, Romans 5.8. So that, Romans 10.9 and 10, if we confess Jesus as Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved, in verse 13, all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. That this is not a private calling. That this is not a personal thing. We have confessed Christ as our Lord. So I, we come to this baptistry on the Lord's Day for those who have made this confession, and we make a public confession. We, we publicly tell that we have put our trust in Jesus. And Jesus says, for those who have confessed him as Lord, those who have acknowledged him before man, then God, or excuse me, the Son of Man will acknowledge them before God. We have safety and security and hope in Christ. It's one category. The other one is for those who deny Jesus before men. The Pharisees denied Jesus and their teachings and their actions. They, they taught that there was salvation and self-righteousness. That they had before them the, the, the living Christ, the Messiah, the word of God incarnate, and they refused him. And today, people will refuse him. And perhaps some of you this morning, you have and you will refuse him. The sad reality is that there will be pews and chairs and benches and floors filled this morning with people on this Lord's Day who will hear clearly the gospel of Jesus proclaimed and who will walk away from the gospel unchanged. And again, Jesus doesn't say, well, you know, there's kind of this third, no, that you are either for him or against him. You are either in him or outside of him. You either will go into glory or you will be cast into hell. And it's important to understand this context. And it's important to see this argument that Jesus has been building 
in order then to rightly understand what comes next. Verse 10, and everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. So Jesus here gives hope to those of us who have cursed the name of God, who have cursed the name of Christ, who have turned our back on the gospel, perhaps for years before putting our trust in Jesus. And people like the Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul says of himself in his own testimony, 1 Timothy 1 verse 13, that, that he formerly was a blasphemer, that he formerly was a persecutor, that he formerly was an insolent opponent. Jesus here is standing before disciples that later Paul will persecute and will even stand over their death and their execution. And yet God's grace was sufficient for Paul because he came to see the light of the gospel and he responded to the light of the gospel in faith and repentance. Jesus says you, you can speak a word, a sentence, a paragraph, novels against the Son of Man. And there's hope for you. There's forgiveness. I have shared the gospel with people before who have said to me, Pastor, you don't understand what I've done. You don't understand what I've said. There's, there's not hope for me. No, friend, there is hope for you. There is hope for every living person on planet Earth today. You are not the sovereign gods. And his grace is sufficient and his mercy is more. But Jesus says also as well here, the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Now, I want you to note something. This is important. He does not say cannot be forgiven. He does not say that there's categorically a group of people who are outside of the reach of the grace of God, of people who, who because of all they've done, well, they just can't be saved. He says they won't be saved. And why won't they be saved? Because they have blasphemed against the Holy Spirit. Who is he speaking of? I think he's speaking of who he's already spoken of. <laughs> and the early, or excuse me, in just the first few verses of this chapter, he's talked about the hypocrite who tried to cover their own sin. And with their dying breath, they have blasphemed the Holy Spirit because they have refused to respond to the enlightenment of the Spirit. They refused to respond to the light of the gospel. In their dying breath, they had said, I will not put my trust in Jesus. And at that moment, he says, well, there's no forgiveness any longer for them. There was an opportunity up until the point there wasn't an opportunity. To blaspheme the Holy Spirit, that word blaspheme means to, to malign and to slander. It is speaking of those, I believe, who earlier in chapter 11 would see Christ Jesus cast out a demon and would attribute that which was done according to the power of the Holy Spirit to the power of Satan. They are blaspheming the Holy Spirit. They're maligning the Holy Spirit. Yeah, he's speaking of those he has already spoken of. He's speaking of the person who's cast into hell because they refuse to trust in Christ. He's speaking of the one who he spoke of immediately preceding to this, the one who denies him before man and who will be denied before the Father. He says the person who blasphemes the Holy Spirit is the person who slanders the Holy Spirit. J.C. Rowell refers to this sin and this person in this way. He wrote this. Worst of all, speaking of their sin, it is a sin which is commonly accompanied by utter deadness, hardness, and insensibility of the heart. The man whose sins will not be forgiven is precisely the man who will never seek to have them be forgiven. This is exactly the root of his awful disease. He might be pardoned, but he will not seek to be pardoned. He is a gospel-hardened and twice-dead person with a conscience that is seared with a hot iron. The person who never responds to the gospel and never seeks a pardon from Christ will not be pardoned. The person with an unrepentant heart will not repent and therefore will not be forgiven. But for those who have trusted in him, Jesus says, Verse 11, and when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Why? Because you have not blasphemed the Holy Spirit. You have put your trust in the Holy Spirit. Do you see what Jesus is painting for us here? 
And it's a beautiful picture of hope for those who have responded to the gospel and are empowered by the Holy Spirit, who Jesus says here, he will give you the words to say, he will give you the words to pray, he will empower you, even in moments when you have every reason to have more fear and anxiety than you've ever had before. You can have hope, and you can have trust. Why? We read it earlier, Romans 8. Because we can be sure that neither life, nor death, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. But for those who have not trusted in Christ, you are separate from God and his love now. But there is still an opportunity for you to repent. And so the question for us as we walk away from this text then is, should we be encouraged or should we be warned? If your trust is in Jesus, then friend, you should be encouraged because there is nothing in this life for you to fear. Not man, not the enemy, not sickness, not death, not cancer, not any other thing because your hope is in Christ and he has secured for you glory. But if your hope is not in Christ, be warned. There is no middle ground. There is no neutral position. Forgiveness is available until it's not. And the invitation is here for you today. And our prayer is that you would repent. And so we want to give you that opportunity now. If you would stand as I pray for us.